thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, this is a special Stanford event. We've got Bob Joss, as you can see on the screen with us here today, talking about Leadership de Demystified. This is our first virtual alumni education event of the academic year. We're excited to get on board again with these wonderful offerings. And uh, we're especially excited about all of the international alumni who are joining us here today. Um, this is sort of a precursor to what we're going to be doing this summer, an international alumni weekend. We're back in business with our in-person events, and we're going to be doing one in Poland come June, and we couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, speaking about being thrilled, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Bob Joss to you today. Um, I'm thrilled because Bob is fundamentally a Stanford icon. He has two Stanford degrees, an MBA. Don't you laugh at your iconic status, Bob, it's true. He has an MBA from Stanford from the GSB. He also has a PhD from the GSB. But most important to you, he was an absolutely superior dean for 10 years at the GSB, 1999 to 2009 and is, a, is a, an essential member of the Stanford community. And I'm excited because he's gonna be talking to you today about the dynamics of effective management and leadership and which factors contribute to the success of managers and leaders. Anyone that works in any capacity, for-profit, non-profit, companies, boards, you name it, this is super, super important stuff. And I have to tell you something, I'm so excited to be able to introduce Bob because one of the last times that Bob and I were on something like this, it was in person, it was a Leadership Academy event at Stanford where different members of the Stanford administration talked to up and coming directors and senior directors about how to grow at Stanford. And I walked into the room and Bob was finishing his presentation. And there are two people on this campus you do not want to follow, Bob Joss and Condi Rice. So to be able to introduce them as opposed to follow him today is a really a treat. There's someone else I'd also like to introduce to you today. Her name is Diane Stewart. She's from the class of 84. And she'll be coming on the screen. There she is. Uh, class of 84, as you see, she has a child who graduated last June and then one who is still here. And she's the president of the Stanford Women's Network, a part of the UK Alumni Club. She'll come back on screen later after Bob is done talking and, and Diane will be the moderator of our Q&A session. So um, Diane and I are now going to go off screen and we're going to leave it to Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. We're excited about Bob. Well, Howard, thanks very much for that nice introduction. And while I'm getting my screen ready to share here with everybody, let me say that my goal today is to help you get a better understanding, a better awareness of what leadership's all about. And in particular, I want to demystify it. And I use that word because there's quite a bit of mystery around leadership. You know, I went to Amazon books this week, and I typed in leadership, and there are over 60,000 books on this subject. And yet, despite this tremendous literary outpouring, here's what one scholar had to say, you know, leadership, it has an elusive, mysterious quality about it. Easy to recognize, hard to describe, difficult to practice, and almost impossible to create in others on demand. So I thought I'd test out these four observations in the process of telling you the most common questions I get about leadership and, and how I answer them. But let's start with his observation, is it easy to recognize? And, um, you know, I find if I ask MBAs or alumni or executive students, they have no problem coming up with an example from history or from the news you know, about a, a leader that comes to mind. And, you know, it could be Mandela or Gandhi or Churchill or Thatcher or Mother Teresa or Lincoln. Uh, people say, wow, you know, they're leaders in my mind because they were visionary, they were great communicators, they were charismatic, um, they were inspiring. And so no problem, easy to recognize. But also when I ask them, well, what about people that you've been personally close to? You know, did you recognize leadership there? And again, no problem. People come up with teachers, coaches, family members, immediate bosses, people that had a, a real impact on their lives, usually very different from the famous people. The comments here are, you know, they really trusted me. They backed me. They pushed me to do something I didn't think I could do. Uh, but it's easy to recognize, and if it's so easy to recognize, why is it so hard to describe? 
Well, I imagine, you know, that that has to, something to do with the 60,000 books, you know, the reason <laughs> so many people have tried. And uh, I haven't begun to read all 60,000, believe me, but I've read a lot. And for my money, one of the very best writers about leadership was our own John Gardner. You know, John was a faculty member at the business school and at the ed school. He thought very deeply about leadership. He himself was an outstanding civic leader in America. And John said, look, it's not about fame or fortune or status or power. You know, he said, leadership is about, it's about responsibility. And, uh, and he said, it's about responsibility in particular for a group. You can't think of leadership without thinking of it in the context of some larger group, you know, that could be a work team, it could be a small business, it could be a division in a company or an enterprise, it could be a, a public entity, you know, like a school or a hospital or a unit of government, a city, county, even a country. But you have to think of it in the context of a group pursuing its purpose and seeing that that group does better, however you wanna measure it or think about it. I think another scholar who I admired a lot, Ed Shine, pulled John Gardner's ideas together and said, look, it's about wanting to do something new and better and getting others to go along. Short, sweet, I like it, a great definition. Second question I wanna share that I get a lot is, you know, is there a difference between management and leadership? Because we often see the terms used interchangeably. And uh, I think the answer is yes, there is, but it's not what people often think. You know, you'll hear people say, ah, she's a great leader, but you know, just not good at managing, or he's a great manager, but quite weak as a leader, as if people could only be good at one or the other, and, uh, or you couldn't do both together. And I think, I think the person that had the best insight on this for my reading was a scholar at the Harvard Business School, which is okay. <laughs> Uh, John Cotter. And John spent his career just studying, you know, what do leaders, managers really do? And he said, look, if you're responsible for a group of people, as John Gardner said, you know, you have to do two kinds of work. Number one, you have to do management work, the work you do to help the group cope with complexity. Now, groups are complicated. There are lots of interdependencies. And so we have plans and budgets to figure out where's the money coming from? Where's the money going? You know, we have organization charts and job descriptions and divisions of responsibility. Uh, so people know who's doing what. Uh, we do a lot of controlling. We compare our actual performance to our plan performance, both individually and for the entire group. We're solving problems. We're pushing the group in the right direction. It's really important work. It's an awful lot of what we teach, what we do at the Stanford GSB. But he said, there's another kind of work you also have to do. And think of leadership as a kind of work. He said, it's the work you have to do to help your group cope with the need for change. And it's a rare group that doesn't need the change. You know, you're being pushed by competitors, by markets, by regulation. And uh, he said, that work is so different from management work. It involves these three things. First of all, some sense of direction, you know, change from what to what. What do you want to look like if you go through a change and it's different from today? The second thing is he called aligning people, which is, he, he said, well, you know, it's a lot of communicating. It's just communicating, communicating. John Gardner liked to say, all leaders are teaching. And especially they're answering and addressing the question of why, you know, why do we need to change? What's in it for me? Change is painful for a lot of people. They don't like it. So a, a need to convince, to persuade uh, people that the change is beneficial. And the third element of this leadership work is motivation, you know, so people don't lose hope. Uh, most major organization change efforts do not succeed. You know, people do lose heart. They do lose hope. They give up. Uh, the job of a leader, said John Gardner, is to keep hope alive. A leader is a dealer in hope, said Napoleon. So that's leadership work. Now, when you look at these um, skills that are required for these two different kinds of work, it's pretty interesting to see the differences. You know, management work is all about 
appealing to people's thinking. You know, it's rational, it's analytical, it's about keeping the place in compliance and under control. It's more of a science. In fact, we even talk about management science. It, it operates through formal power, a boss and a subordinate, and we know each other's roles. Uh, it works through hierarchy and systems and we're onto solutions, we're executing. It's, it's the hard stuff in the sense that it's quantifiable in dollar terms or other number terms. The leadership work is a totally different set of skills. You know, it's about how people feel. It's emotional in its structure. It's about inspiring commitment. Uh, it's much more of an art than a science. As a leader, you're really dependent on people to get enthused, to get excited about the change that you're talking about. It works through people and culture. And you often have many more questions than solutions and you have to learn your way forward. It's the soft stuff. And yet, you know, the touchy feely, the organizational behavior. And yet, as we know, you know, the soft is what's really difficult. And when I look at these two kinds of work and the skills required, it, it reminds me uh, a bit of the game of golf. You know, in, in golf, there's a long game and a short game, and they could not be more different in terms of the skills required. And yet, if you want to master the game, you need to be good at both aspects of the game. And if you want to be good at helping a group achieve its purpose, you do have to be good at both kinds of work. You know, the more the more your group needs to change, maybe you do more leadership work. And the more senior you are, maybe you're doing more leadership work. But nobody is ever just exclusively doing one or the other. You've got to do both. So leadership work. You know, Cotter said it's about vision, alignment, and motivation. I often wondered, you know, how he came up with those three things. But a couple other scholars, I really admire their work. Warren Bennis said, look, a leader has to provide three things, direction, trust, and hope. And at Santa Clara, you know, Jim Cousins and Barry Posner said, you know, uh, we surveyed over 30 years, as many as 2 million employees and said, what do you look for in a leader? What do you want in your leader? And these are the three things that came up the most. We want our leader to be forward-looking, to be honest and inspiring. And when I look across these three, I'm struck, you know, how much they landed on the same page and really came up with the same three aspects or elements of what leadership work is all about. As I said, you know, it's the work you do to help the group cope with the need for change and change is hard, but it's also what uh, a couple of scholars at the Kennedy School Ron Heifetz and Don Laurie call the hardest kind of change, you know, the sort of change where the group has to face up to its most difficult challenges. And they call it adaptive change. This is the change where, you know, you know the group needs to change, but uh, you don't know exactly all the steps to get there. And you have to, uh, you have to have others help you come up with the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to bear the whole burden, but you do need to get the group learning its way forward, needing it to adapt. And, uh, you know, they said, look, after all, your job is not to maximize the group's comfort. Your job is to maximize their well being. And sometimes you have to knock them out of their comfort zone to face up to these most difficult challenges adaptive change. And I think because leadership is this difficult work of change and this hard kind of change, that's probably why David Campbell said, you know, it's difficult to practice. Third question I get a lot, are, are leaders born or made? It's kind of an age old question. And I'm ask, gonna ask you this question. We're gonna put up a very quick poll, you know, only a few seconds, but where do you come down on this? You know, are leaders largely born or are they largely made? And I'll give you, you know, 15, 20 seconds, you know, we'll zip through and get a show of hands. Um, yeah, and it's really interesting. It's a, you're sort of tending toward um, a 30% largely born and 70%, 65% largely made. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is that that's, um, you know, that's where 
social science research comes out a little bit. You know, there are obviously some characteristics, some inherited attributes that are really valuable when it comes to uh, to leadership work. And uh, <clears throat> oh, we can share the results if you want to just look quickly here. Hopefully, people see that it's thirty five sixty five. And uh, but I think the <clears throat> excuse me the weight of the evidence and and maybe you can take let me take that down now at the moment the weight of the evidence is that um, while there are these inherited attributes that are helpful and valuable the born part of the question that most of the most of the research says you know leaders are largely made and and so then a follow on question. If leaders are made, <clears throat> does that mean leadership can be taught? Which may be a funny question for someone who teaches a leadership seminar for the last 23 years to MBAs. But my answer to that is, you know, <clears throat> leadership can't be taught, but it can be learned. And there's a distinction, you know, and the learning for leadership is leadership, you know, get into a leadership role and see if you can play that role to help a group change for the better. Take on the responsibility. You know, the Chinese have a saying, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember, but I do and I understand. And of course, understanding is that deepest form of learning and uh, leadership learning <clears throat> is this learning by doing. And it's not just the Chinese. Here's a 2000 year old Greek philosopher. Whatever we learn to do, we learn by actually doing it. And that's why we say leadership learning is experiential learning, learning by doing. But there are some paradoxes in this learning that I'd like to share with you. You know, one is it can take a long time. <clears throat> Experience is the hardest kind of teacher, gives you the test first and the lesson afterward. And some people, some people never get the lesson. You know, they just don't reflect enough on the test. So it can take a long time. Second thing is, <clears throat> while we learn a lot by not making mistakes in so much of our learning, uh, in leadership learning, we often learn the most from mistakes and mistakes are painful and difficult to admit or face up to. Um, I often ask people, you know, how did you learn to hire people? And most people will say, you know, I learned by hiring the wrong person. And uh, if it was easy and you got it right all the time, you often don't learn much because no one ever gets it right all the time. I had a boss early in my career who said, you know, I've got to leave you in this job long enough for your mistakes to bite you in the rear end. And I didn't quite get what he meant until I made a big mistake and I had to work my way through it. Um, and I think I see today even sometimes fast growing companies, people get promoted so quickly that they aren't in the job long enough to get this sort of learning, <clears throat> learning from mistakes. And it's not just mistakes, it's, um, it's what, Morgan McCall calls powerful experiences, you know, these hairpin curves, these stomach turning drops. <clears throat> and here are some of the powerful experiences that, um, that he puts in his, in his book. Um, and as I scroll through them, this is not all of them, but most of them, uh, you know, it's a pretty daunting list. And I suspect that many of you on the call have have had some of these powerful experiences. I, I know when I look through the list, I think I've had virtually all of them. And uh, I'll have to say they weren't necessarily fun, but as I look back, they were great learning experiences. You know, I had a director at the bank in Australia where I was. And when we had a particularly challenging situation, he used to say, oh, this is, this is such a character building experience. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I could do without all this character building, but but he really was right about that. He he had a good point. Powerful experiences. After all, an experience can only teach what's in it. So the more challenging, the more powerful the experience, the greater the learning opportunity. 
Here's an interesting observation. Jeff Immelt, who wrote a book just a, a year or two ago after his time as CEO at GE, says, I wish I had experienced more different things to be better prepared for the world I saw. And he talked in his book about during his tenure all the way up to becoming CEO, GE did so well. It was always onward and upward. He didn't have as many of these powerful experiences as Morgan McCall mentions. A mind stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions, which is why experiential learning can be so powerful. And then a final element of leadership learning is, you know, in any organization, there's kind of a natural hierarchy of management and leadership work. And in each of these various roles, you learn so much more. You know, we start by managing ourselves and we get good at that. that that's how we all got into Stanford uh, because we're in control of our work and we meet our deadlines and we deliver high quality work. And then maybe someone asks us to manage other people. And there, you know, the skills that made you good at your earlier job are not going to help you much at all in the new job. You know, you're no longer doing the work, you're managing the doers. You're trying to figure out how to schedule it and how to uh, assign it and figure out who can and who can't do the work and how to coach those who are struggling. And then maybe you manage managers. And that sounds very similar to managing others, except the people you're now managing are managers and you have to figure out who can and who can't manage and how do you deal with that situation? How do you coach them and help them get better as managers? And how do you stay in touch with the front line? Um, maybe you're a functional manager in, in something like finance or human resources or strategy or marketing. And uh, your job is to see that the group, the organization succeeds through excellence in your function. And yet most of the people who really deliver the function, if you will, don't work for you. They work all throughout the organization and you're in a staff role trying to, trying to influence without a lot of authority, trying to work with other members of the staff organization and meet a lot with line people, lots of peer relationship development. Or a business manager, you got to pull it all together. You got to line and staff working with each other. You got to think strategically. You got to think operationally. You have to know what's going on. And it goes on with bigger organizations to group executives, enterprise manager. The important point is the reason they drew these lines and you know, kind of switching directions is you have to go through such a complete reinvention of yourself at each one of these passages. Um, you literally have to find a new way of thinking and a new way of being. You develop new skills, you spend your time differently, you value different things. And it's a way of learning so much about leadership and management, depending on the type of experience you have here. Not just a challenging experience, but a different level of complexity. Uh, and so, you know, I think because, um, you know, there's so much learning to go on in terms of leadership learning. Uh, James McGregor Burns had a famous statement, you know, the most marked characteristic of a leader is the capacity to learn from others without being threatened. The capacity to learn from others without being threatened. These others could be your subordinates, your peers, your bosses, your customers. There are so many sources where you can gain learning. But because this learning takes time, because it means mistakes, because you learn from powerful experiences and all different levels of complexity, I think this is why David Campbell said, you know, it's almost impossible to create in others on demand. You know, it takes time. Fourth question I get often is, you know, is leadership transportable? Could, could you be a very effective, successful leader in one company or industry or culture? And can you transport that to a different situation, a different company, industry, culture, and, and be equally effective, be equally successful? Uh, it's a very common question. And again, it's one I want to stop and take a quick poll on and just see how do you come out on this? We'll take a few seconds here now that I know how to work these. 
Oh, very interesting. Yeah. No. So you're you're very you're like the MBA students. You know, when I ask this in class, I'd say at least 80 percent. And uh, and that's where you come out. You know, at least 80 percent um, say, you know, it's yeah, it's readily transportable. And, uh, you know, a good leader in uh, in one circumstance can be a good leader in another. And, you know, I think there's no question that's true. But I also want to say that it's really tough. <laughs> um, you know, we talk about leadership taking place in a context, you know, and that context changes uh, and it puts, you know, a lot of interesting challenges to people. The situation that um, comes to my mind is, uh, you know, John Gardner said a lot of leadership is teaching, you know, and it's hard to teach in a situation if you don't understand it deeply. And it's hard to understand it deeply if you haven't experienced it enough. And that's why when someone does move into a different situation, a different industry, company, country, culture, um, you need a fair bit of humility uh, about how much you don't know. And you need to ask a lot of questions. You need to uh, recognize that uh, there's a lot of learning to take place. You know, we have a lot of speakers at uh, at Stanford Business School. We have a view from the top. And one of our speakers a few years back was, was a fellow named Ron Johnson, who's a Stanford alumnus. And he had a really interesting career. I think he was an outstanding leader at Target, that successful retailer, and a very senior role. And on the strength of his track record at Target, he was recruited by Steve Jobs to come to Apple and roll out that hugely successful concept of Apple stores. And on the strength of <clears throat> his leadership at Apple, he was recruited to become the CEO of JC Penney's. Penney's is that iconic but troubled retailer. You know, there was so much excitement when Ron Johnson's appointment was announced, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, that the share, the stock, <clears throat> the stock price at Penney's went up 40%. And yet, 17 months later, he was fired by his board of directors. You know, what worked at Target, what worked at Apple, just didn't work at J.C. Penney's. And I always wondered a bit about what happened. And, you know, seven or eight years later, he gave an interview in the Wall Street Journal. They said, what happened at Penney's? He said, well, I went too fast. I went too fast for the board, too fast for the employees, too fast for the company. And then he had this concluding statement. He said, you know, I was kind of situationally arrogant, <laughs> situationally arrogant, which I guess is another way of saying, you know, I didn't take the time to figure out this different context, which was J.C. Penney's. Um, so I think, you know, your job as a leader, when you come into a new situation, you're trying to help that group cope with the need for change. But don't expect change to happen unless you can change also. You can't bring your old self to this new context, which is what makes the transferability or transportability of leadership a really tough challenge and uh, one that people have to be careful about. The last question I want to share with you is, um, are there certain tasks that a leader can't delegate? Um, this is, uh, you know, delegation is something we like to do. That's how we develop leaders within our own organization is to give them more and more responsibility. But John Gardner liked to remind me that there, there are two things you really can't delegate as a leader. The first is this business of setting direction. You know, we... <laughs> We wanna have a lot of conversation. We wanna gather input. We want people's ideas and debate. But at some point, you know, somebody has to say the train is leaving on this track at this time in this direction. I hope everybody can get on board, but if not, the train is gonna leave without you. And that's the job of a leader. Uh, or as our great tennis coach, wonderful guy, Dick Gould, who recently wrote a great book on leadership. He said, you know, often the leader envisions things that the rest of the team cannot yet see. 
And it is that responsibility of vision, of setting direction, that John said, no, you just can't delegate that. That's your job, whatever group you're leading. And the second thing he said, you know, you can't delegate is that when you're in a leadership role responsible for a group, you serve as that group symbol. You know, you represent that group to the outside world and you represent that group to itself. And, and you just can't delegate that to anyone else. Uh, you know, this was really brought home to me in a rather poignant way when I was at the bank in Australia and we had a tragic situation 1,400 miles away in New Zealand where there was a holdup in a branch and one of our tellers was shot and killed. It's really my first experience with a fatality in many, many years of finance. And uh, we were commiserating about this at our headquarters in Sydney. And uh, our head of human resources said, well, Bob, you're going to the funeral, aren't you? And I had to confess, you know, I hadn't thought about it and I wasn't sure it was a little uncomfortable. Gee, I didn't want to be a distraction. I didn't know the people there. Oh, no, he said, it's really important that you go. And I had such a respect for his, his views and my wife, who said, of course you should go, that I went. And it left a huge impression on me. I was kind of blown away by the experience. It meant so much to the family of the person who'd been killed. It seemed to mean so much to the staff in New Zealand um, that I, I never forgot it. I remembered this, this and it wasn't so really me personally, but, but you know, I was representing nearly 40,000 people who, who were hurting and grieving uh, along with them in this tough situation. And, you know, a few years later, uh, when I was back at Stanford and, and teaching a course on leadership, I read one of those 60,000 books. And the book was by, uh, interestingly enough, by Rudy Giuliani, who, who's in the news now for a lot of different reasons. But at the time, he had recently stepped down as mayor of New York. And he wrote a pretty good book on leadership. And when I got to chapter 11 in his book, the chapter heading was... Weddings discretionary, funerals mandatory. And in that chapter, he's talked about, you know, when the group is celebrating and having a good time, you know, it might be nice to be there, but you don't have to be there. But he said, when the group is hurting, that's when a leader needs to be present. And of course, that whole New Zealand experience, you know, just came flooding back to me in a way that I now understood you know, why it had left such a big impression on me. And, um, you know, as fate would have it, a few years beyond that, you know, we had five tragic fatalities of students at the GSB with accidental deaths. And uh, I knew exactly what I had to do. You know, I had to meet with the families. I had to be present with the students involved in the memorial services. Uh, it just was now automatic in my learning. And it's a, you know, it's a really good example of how leadership learning takes place. You know, you have an experience like I did in New Zealand and you have a chance to reflect on it, which is important. So much, so much reflection is required. And then if you can make sense out of it, which I really did in, in reading Giuliani's comments, that, that it's really meaningful for you and you can integrate it into who you are and how you behave going forward. And then if you have a similar or even closely similar new experience, you know exactly what to do. It's just a way of thinking and being that is now a part of you. And that's a really good example of leadership learning. It's also a good example of how leaders play a role. You know, I call it a role one plays in changing an organization for the better. And uh, in that definition, you know, every word is really important. You know, we talk about an organization because leadership takes place within a group, a group with a purpose, and you're accepting responsibility for success of that group. And, uh, and of course it's about changing because we said the, it's the work you do to help the group cope with the need for change. And there's no point in changing unless you really think it's gonna be for the better, which means you have some vision 
of what better looks like. And then you're doing all this teaching and persuading about why that change is needed. And then you're doing so much motivating. So the group keeps at it, doesn't lose heart and doesn't lose hope. And then finally, there's this role that you're playing. And, um, you know, John Gardner liked to remind me that, look, he said, leadership's not really a science at all. It's an art. And he said, in particular, it's a performing art, a performing art. And in this performing art, he said, you know, you, you are the instrument. So you need to know it well. You need to play it well. And uh, I think that's why so much of the leadership literature is about self-awareness and self-knowledge and self-management. And it's especially important that you, you learn how to play what might have been little used parts of you until you took on a leadership responsibility. And these would be the parts that you know, are, are capable of evoking emotions and feelings in people. You know, as we said, the leadership work is uh, the kind of work where feelings dominate thinking. And as Maya Angelou famously said, you know, people, people will forget what you said. You know, they'll forget what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. And, you know, who you are and how you are as this leadership instrument is going to have the biggest impact on how people feel, not how smart or how clever you are, but um, how you behave and the example that you offer to others. And I think this is why Warren Bennis, the great leadership scholar, said, you know, people become leaders the moment they decide how to be, how to be. And Gandhi was famous for saying, be the change you want to see in the world. And I like to say, you know, be the change you want to see in your group, in your organization. You know, as a leader, you need to model the behavior that is critical to bringing the group toward a more successful future that you're trying to achieve. Well, leadership. I hope you would agree with me that it's that's not intellectually complicated, but but it is behaviorally complicated. Like, there's no question about that. And it's emotionally taxing. Uh, it helps to strengthen uh, yourself emotionally and develop your emotional intelligence. It helps to keep your eye on the prize, which is uh, a group achieving something pretty special, you know, and you're playing a role in bringing people along toward that better future. It's uh, it's difficult work, it's taxing work, but very fulfilling. You know, it can allow you to do something greater than yourself and to bring meaning both your lives and the lives of others. And it's work that's that's never been more important. You know, it's um, it is certainly the case that in modern society, we rely on organizations to get things done. You know, virtually everything that we do in terms of producing and delivering goods and services, they're done through organizations, through institutions, you know, and how well those organizations work uh, has a lot to do with our own success as people. You know, it, it helps improve our standard of living, our quality of life. And, you know, when those organizations do poorly, people get hurt. They can lose their jobs, they lose their savings, they might lose their health or education opportunities. Uh, so the performance of organizations and how well they are led, the leadership that's brought to them, has never been more important than it is today. And also, you know, just like these elephants, you know, plodding across the plain, uh, it's a journey and it's a it's really a never ending journey you know and it's a journey in two dimensions really one is it's a hero's journey you know uh there will come a time in your lifetime when you maybe are tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do something quite special unique to you and what a tragedy if that moment finds you unprepared or unqualified or unwilling for that, which might have been your finest hour, says Winston Churchill so eloquently. 
It's a hero's journey. And if that call comes, answer the call. That's one piece of advice. But it's also a learning journey. As John Gardner reminds us so much, it's, um, you know, you never stop learning. You never master this thing called leadership. You learn something new virtually every day and every year if you're open to the learning, if you take the time to reflect and learn. And so the other piece of advice is never stop learning. Well, I hope I've been able to uh, increase your awareness, your understanding of what leadership's all about. And in particular, I hope I've taken some of the mystery out of it. And now I would look forward very much to taking on your questions and, and having a conversation with you further. And I'll turn it back to Diane. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Just. That was terrific. And um, I think because of the, uh, the title, the topic of this conversation, we've had so many questions submitted, not just during the chat, but also uh, when everyone here first registered to be here. So we have a lot of questions. Right. The Stanford team has tried to organize them in various categories for us, and but we won't get to all of them. So apologies in advance for those we don't get to. But we have some that are, you know, lumped together and I've been trying to um, follow along and 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 add some value here. Um, one there's a combination of questions that I find personally very interesting. And you talked about, um, you had your chart listing out the qualities of a leader. Um, and the question is, how do, you, uh, how do you compare and contrast the qualities of a good leader or an evil leader? And I would go through your chart and I would say that the leaders like Stalin and Lenin and Hitler they have mostly the same qualities, except maybe honesty, you know, maybe not honesty, but what what would you like to, what could you tell us about that? And why do so many people follow these leaders who we would definitely consider as evil? No, it's a great question. And it comes up always in class, um, you know, in the context say of Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, and the chart I put up was about the skills required to do management work and to be good at leadership work. And no question, a lot of these so-called evil leaders had a lot of those skills, those leadership skills. You know, they could inspire people. They could evoke emotion. Um, and they were gifted communicators. So they had those skills where I think and come where I come out on this is where they fell down is remember, it's a role one plays in changing an organization for the better, for the better. And I think the bottom line test, you know, in the case, for example, of Hitler, he was going to make Germany great again, but it didn't work out. Uh, it was not for the better. It was much worse. And uh, the German people came to understand that and don't want to go back to that. So, you know, I, I think it's ultimately uh, has to do with the person's vision of what better looks like. Um, and that's not so much a skill. They can be skillful at, a, at trying to persuade you toward a, a false vision. And so being able to discriminate between um, a vision I want to follow and one that I don't think is true, I think that's that's the distinction I would draw. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you also talked about experiential learning. Um, how how do you identify and help to promote those leaders who perhaps have had no experiences? And how has that been altered by this new environment where we have either virtual or hybrid working conditions? How does that leader get that experience? How are they identified? <clears throat> Yeah, great question. Uh, because you know, people can only learn this from experience, from taking on a leadership responsibility. Uh, and the important thing when you are in a spot where you're trying to develop, say, younger leaders, people under you, is to be sure you're giving them that responsibility, uh, but also with the right kind of coaching. You know, there's a great scholar who wrote a book, Charles Handy. Uh, he talked about allowing your people to make mistakes 
above the water line, but not below the water line. And, you know, I'm not a sailor, but I get that concept pretty quickly. You know, <clears throat> there are mistakes that people could make and learn from that won't sink the ship. And you often, you know, you have to withhold yourself a bit and step back and let them learn from those mistakes and coach them around. Could that have been done better? You want to save them from making below the waterline mistakes that could sink the ship. So I, I think that's a good way to keep that in mind as you're trying to develop younger leaders. Thank you. Um, and given you know Stanford's location in Silicon Valley and the various startups and some of these startup companies that are are operating on a thread for a long time. How do you as a leader or how do you suggest a leader maintain the morale and momentum and continue to inspire? What are what would be some of the specific things that needed for as opposed to a, a major corporate leader? You have you know these these startups and it's hard when you yeah. need money. Yeah, it is hard. And it and and the other thing as I mentioned, which I want to come back to is um, you know, they're growing so fast. Uh, and moving people so quickly that they they often, in fact, frequently, don't spend enough time in a job to really learn very much. You know, they 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 have this role and they're moved on to that role, and and they don't have these so-called powerful experiences or these mistakes where they they realize this is not easy. You know, they they uh, they get promoted and promoted, and then at some point though they'll run into a really difficult situation they just don't know how to handle. So, you know, I think one of the challenges that that all of the startups that want to become big companies realize is that they're growing faster than their people are growing management skills, that then faster than they're growing leadership skills. And they have to try to compensate for that. Um, I know Google has spent a lot of time on this as they got bigger and bigger and realized, you know, they were they were just really short of management and leadership skill and talent. And uh, so they spent a lot of effort on it and a lot of coaching, a lot of training, a lot of um, teaching people, you know, what good management and good leadership is all about and encouraging practice. Cause you, you, you can only, you can only learn it from practice. Uh, you can read a lot about it. You can go to class, but you you really you have to get in and take on the responsibility and own it and feel it and practice it to uh, to ultimately learn what leadership's all about. Now I know we talked a little bit about whether leaders were um, were born into leadership um, possibility, but do you have an opinion as to extrovert introvert who makes the best leader? Well, I think I do think uh, there are certain certain sort of inherited attributes, your extroversion, your communication skill, your warmth about people, your ability to connect with people, which is so critical. I think, you know, I don't know where all that comes from. Some of it can be learned and some of it is just sort of you and, and how you grew up, maybe born or at least early nurturing by your parents. Um, there's no question those 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 elements or those attributes, personal characteristics can be super helpful. Uh, but I think, you know, I do think people largely learn this, you know, they learn it by taking on, if it, they take on the responsibility, if they really care about the group and they care more about the group success than their own personal success. And that shows, you know, people see that and people know that you can be introverted and you can be shy, but if people, genuinely can see that you really want this group to succeed and get better however clumsily you might convey that or communicate that uh, you can be a very powerful and effective leader uh without being you know this charismatic and uh, extremely fluid speaker that people often think about you know in leadership now, you know, people do follow, you know, charismatic narcissists from time to time. There's no doubt about that because uh, they get mesmerized by that. And uh, but ultimately, it's not a successful strategy. You know, it will ultimately come to an end and usually a very bad end. Uh, but but for a while, you know, like, it's like you say, you can fool all the people some of the time, but but you can't fool them all of the time. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, so we have a lot of questions that doesn't come as any surprise um, that relate to diversity and inclusion. 
Mm-hmm. And um, and most of these are very broad. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the broader ones is to what extent does diversity impact leadership? And narrow down a little bit more would be how has your work or teaching on leadership been impacted by concepts and systems, systems and and perspectives developed by women and uh, native indigenous and people of color and others in underrepresented communities. Yeah, it, you know, diversity is important in the, particularly in the sense that um, as a leader, you want to get a diversity of views. You know, you, you, you don't want group think. You don't want everybody sort of telling you uh, both that you're right or that this is the right way to go. You need people to take different perspective. Now, Diversity can be a state of mind and and everybody can look alike, but it often comes from different experiences and different backgrounds. And and, uh, so one of the values in leadership learning and in being in a leadership role is making sure that you're really getting different points of view and you're getting diverse points of view. The other thing I think that's important is, um, you know, by paying attention to ver- to diversity and just being sure that you're fair, you know, that you're you're doing everything as fairly and equitably as you possibly can, it forces you to put in processes where um, you're trying to take out as much bias as possible, and you're trying to make sure that you're really hiring and promoting for the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. You know, there's a classic case where orchestras, symphony orchestras always used to be virtually made up of white men. And, uh, you know, then they went to a system, just changed the process where all the auditions were done behind a screen. And the people picking the artists, you know, went by the sound of the music and it changed the composition of the orchestra enormously. Now, that's a vivid example, kind of easy to see, but it's a very good one to make sure you think about in all aspects of your company. Do you have a discipline in your processes that is really making sure you're doing things fairly, equitably, inclusively? You'll get a better outcome if you do. And would you have any special advice for those leaders, those already in leadership positions who are in those underrepresented groups who might occasionally get pushback from others that feel intimidated or pushed aside? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. You know, it, it, you know, anytime you're different, if you're, if you're sort of different from the majority, uh, I do think, um, it may not seem fair, but you do have to work really hard to to uh, to demonstrate that you're bringing something to the group that um, that that you know overcomes any difference that people see in you. You know, I, I my only experience with this since I you know I'm a white male, but for uh, quite a while in my career I was the youngest. You know, and I think that was the difference I could see with you know all these elderly or more elderly people in senior positions. And I was quite aware, I, I, I had to demonstrate that, that you know, I, while I was younger, I could bring something. And I, you know, I just think that's, that's something when you fall into a minority group, however the group might be defined, um, you just have to, you have to do your best to, to demonstrate that competency. And do you have any particular views on quotas in order to try to make our groups, our organizations more diverse? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I'm not, the quotas can can serve a, a purpose. I prefer, maybe it's a fine tuning of words. I prefer goals and timetables. And like we used to have going way back in the early days, of affirmative action, I'm you know quotas make you nervous all the time. I, I'm not a fan of of a quota and that we must do this and must do that. We wanna we wanna do things fairly, equitably, and on merit as best we see it. Uh, but we definitely should strive to to accomplish certain goals. And I think uh, having a goal to make your workforce look more like your customer base, look more like your country or your population. Um, I, you know, I think it's a very good goal. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and I love this question. How do you see, uh, leadership varying by generation 
from baby boomer down to Gen Z. And do you have a preference for a certain type of leadership style? Oh, boy. You know, I, having been retired a while, I don't see as much of um, Gen Z or maybe millennials. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think a key element of leadership is... Um, is, you know, caring about the group and demonstrating that you care about the group. You're not going to get people to come with you if they can see that you're in it for yourself, you know, and you're self-promoting as opposed to you're in it for this group and the group doing well. The, I think one thing that does worry me in recent years is, you know, there's an awful lot of promoting your own brand, your own self, you know, social media, and, and you can give off the impression that you're in it for yourself uh, and that's really kind of deadly to effective leadership, I think, regardless of generation. Uh, and I think sometimes uh, people make the mistake of thinking, oh, that's that's what good leaders do. They promote themselves. Well, I, I just I don't think it's a winning strategy. And uh, it's one thing to be to be cautious and wary about if if you're in the generation that's into a lot of self-promotion. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, on that note, do you think there's a difference in how a political leader should be versus a corporate leader? And do you think it's more acceptable, given that political leaders are having to get the vote of the population who 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 are looking at social media and mm -hmm. popularity? Um, I mean, what is what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it, there's no question. It's a there's a big difference. In fact, one of the interesting aspects of that question about is leadership transportable, is uh, <clears throat> is to observe how hard it has been sometimes for business leaders to move over and become really effective political leaders, and vice versa. Right. Uh, they're very different contexts, very different arenas, and. Um, right. You know, it, within a business, you have much more of a sense of um, making decisions, and 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 the leader can set a direction. You know, within a within a political role, you've got to you've got to bring people with you. You know, you've got to bring as many people. You can't just bring your faction. You know, with you. and I think that's one of the problems today. You know, people appeal to their own faction, and you've got to bring people from the other faction over and you've got to demonstrate that you understand both sides and you know i know there's not an appetite to appeal to the middle but um you know the job of a leader is to bring people with you as ed shine said not bring half the people with you you've got to bring as many you got to bring a lot more than half to be an effective leader both in a company and in a political sense right yeah thank you so we're almost out of time but i wanted to ask you one final question i love this question and that is if you could have dinner with any leader good or bad uh dead or alive who would that be and why nelson mandela he, I just yep. think he was a phenomenal leader who went through incredible hardship 27 years in prison and yet he came out not angry, but wanting to build a, a a better future for his country. You know, and he's just remarkable human being. I would love to have had dinner with him. Yeah, agreed. Um, and so Dean Joss, any final comments before we wrap this up? Well, my final comment would be to the group on the call. You know, I know a lot of you are in leadership roles. You aspire to leadership roles. Um, you know, I compliment you for taking on those responsibilities wherever they might be. You know, it might be in business or it might be in, you know, some nonprofit part of your life. And that's great. And, you know, it's hard work and uh, keep at it. You know, if not you, who else is going to do it? I think um, I want to congratulate you and encourage you and encourage you to take on more because we, the world needs you and the world needs good leadership. Thank you so much, Dean Joss. This has been so useful, so informative, so inspirational. Um, but our time now is coming to an end. And I also like to thank Howard for having been here in the beginning and to the entire Stanford team for making this so well organized. And hopefully next year, uh, we'll be able to do this in person and make it much bigger um, opportunity to have discussions and to meet with people. And so, yes, with that, our time is at an end. And thank you all for attending. And thank you, Dean Joss, again. Thank you. It was great thank being you. with you. Thank you. Thank you.